of Buenos Dias. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, Eustat, for inviting me. And uh, I'm sorry I can't speak to you in Spanish. Um, I, I know about three, three words of Spanish. I, I know a little more French, but, uh, um, but I know three less words in Basque. So, so um, I, 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 but we have some lovely translators in the back there who I can tell are doing a great job. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, um, I've just come from Manchester with a, where there was a, a workshop on adaptive design, which is a big word in, sur in survey world right now. Um, telling them that they should be Bayesian as well. So I'm going around telling people why they should be Bayesian. Um, I, I hope uh, um, you'll find uh, this interesting. Um, uh, and uh, we have a quite varied audience. I think we have some folks who are in more official statistics. We have some mathematicians, I think, and some economists. Um, I always think economists are r really should be Bayesian because they make very strong assumptions to identify their models. Um, and uh, so uh, the main thing I want to say is that please, uh, I hope that you will be, um, uh, feel okay about asking me questions as we go along. So if you want to ask, I'd love you to ask questions. Um, and uh, so don't be shy about asking. So um, Spain is actually uh, an important country for Bayesian statistics. Um, Jose Bernardo, who's a very famous uh, uh, Spanish statistician, was one of the uh, central people in Bayesian statistics. And um, Bayes, there's been a Bayesian conference in Spain for many, many years at Valencia um, that uh, was really the center of, uh, of the Bayesian uh, approach. Um, I was, haven't been to Valencia too many times. I have been to one of their conferences. and. Uh, one of, the, one of the reasons you should be Bayesian is that Bayesians like to have fun, so they tend to meet in fun places. They're, they have a, something called MCM Ski, which is Markov Chain Monte Carlo MCMC, but uh, it's in a ski resort, and uh, they like to meet in sunny beaches and like to drink beer, basically. So, so that's the, probably the main reason why I became interested in Bayes. Um, it has a really fascinating history, Bayesian statistics. Uh, um, th there is a book which, uh, if you're interested and uh, are willing to, 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 it's in English, I'm afraid, but uh, it's called The Theory That Would Not Bar Die. The Theory That Would Not Die. It's a, it's a history of Bayes. Um, talks about a lot of very fascinating applications of Bayes that have, that have taken place. Um, including the code breaking that took place in the Second World War. There's a movie about that uh, uh, that some of you may have seen um, that, uh, uh, that used it really it was based on using Bayesian methods. Um, but a lot of other very interesting areas of application of Bayes. And so Bayes was kind of, it was kind of controversial and considered uh, um, a bad thing to do for many years. There was a lot of... Uh, resistance to using Bayes, but I think it's actually much, much more, uh, um, people are, are much more interested in using Bayes now than they used to be, so um, it's, a, it's a good time. Um, actually, there's a pol pollster called Nate Silver, who's uh, very well known in the States uh, um, uh, for forecasting the, uh, the, the U.S. election, um, and uh, he, uh, he has a book on Bayes, too, which is well, he says why. You have to be Bayesian if you're a pollster. So he comes from political science. So uh, anyway, uh, I give this talk at the joint statistical meetings. And when you do it, at the, the, you're supposed to have learning objectives. So this is the, this is the didactic thing these days. So, so I've just listed some of the things here that uh, I'm hoping to cover over the next two days. So um, I'm going to talk initially about different ways of statistical approaches to doing statistical inference for uh, sample surveys. Um, and uh, the 
different philosophies are actually very fascinating, I think. Um, another reason why I'm interested in this area. Then uh, um, I'm going to talk about simple random sampling, which is the simplest way of uh, selecting a sample from a population. And uh, I mean, a lot of early statistics, a lot of the standard statistical m methods that we use um, are based on uh, assuming simple random sampling. And I'll talk about uh, the, how uh, Bayes and, and model-based methods uh, work for this simple form of, uh, of, of sampling. Then uh, um, the, uh, uh, the role, uh, a little bit of a more theoretical area is um, how the sampling mechanism, the, 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 the uh, design that decides which variables get selected versus which cases are selected, which cases are not selected, um, how that, uh, why that's important for Bayesian inference. Um, one of the uh, um, criticisms of Bayes in early days was that some people felt that uh, Bayesians were saying that you didn't have to do probability sampling. And uh, I don't think that's true. I'm a big fan. I like probability sampling a lot. Um, but the reason why is a little bit different for Bayesians than it is for people who are using the design-based way of doing statistics, which I'll talk about uh, initially. Then uh, um, perhaps uh, then talk about complex design. So one of the main features of uh, survey sampling is uh, that we don't do random, simple random sampling. We, we collect data using the other stratification and weighting and clustering multi-stage samples um, and uh, it's important to understand how those features figure into the Bayesian analysis since I definitely don't think they can be ignored. Then uh, I, I'll talk a bit about uh, um, uh, uh, computational <laughs> tools, um, what's available to do Bayesian uh, statistics in practice these days um, and uh, some of the ideas of how to check models and, uh, and, um, and formulating models. Um, then the last part, um, we'll see how, how long it takes, but uh, if we have time, I'll, I'll talk a bit about survey, missing data and surveys. <coughs> and my main actually area of uh, of work has really been in missing data. And uh, uh, I think the Bayesian way of doing missing data is, for, is very useful. And uh, actually, it's, that's very practical because there are actually a lot of, uh, of programs now that would allow you to do, um, to deal with missing data issues, in, both in surveys and statistics in general. So uh, that's, that's an area where there is actually a lot of statistical software around um, now. I'd like to see more um, statistical software that for, for survey s sampling specifically. I think that's a bit of a, 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 a um, something we're lacking right now. But uh, um, th there are tools that can be used, certainly, as I'll, I'll describe. Um, before I start, um, I, I I teach a Bayes, Bayesian course in surveys with uh, um, my <coughs> colleague at, at Michigan, Trivilar Raganathan, or Ragu, as everybody calls him. Um, and uh, we've done this for a number of years. There's a joint program on survey methodology, which is um, a, a, another, another program for which I've done, done this quite a bit. So. Uh, um, some of these slides come from, from Dr. Raganathan, so I want to acknowledge um, the, uh, his work. And um, if there are any mistakes in the slides, then they're basically his mistakes, because my slides are really perfect. So That was a joke, by the way. So. So. so does anybody have any questions before we start? So. It's a little early to so have questions. But, uh. <laughs> Okay, so um, I've arranged this in um, 
five modules. So um, I'm going to talk um, quite a high level, sort of relatively generally about um, methods for um, doing inference from, from surveys in the introduction, talk about different design-based, model-based inference um, to, to set the stage. Um, then, then I'm going to talk about uh, simple random sampling in module two, um, complex designs, stratification, clustering, and so on in module three, um, computation um, in module four, and then missing data in module five. Okay, so you might ask, uh, well, I sometimes ask, well, what is different about survey sampling statistics relative to other areas of statistics? There are economists here, so we could talk about what's the difference between survey sampling and, and say, econo econometrics or applications of statistics in different areas of uh, science. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to uh, describe that. And then here in, in this first module, alternative modes of survey inference, design-based, model-based inference. Um, and Bayes is uh, a form of modeling. So the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the big difference between standard, what we call design-based inference, and, and Bayes is that Bayes involves formulating statistical models. Um, so uh, most of what we do in statistics um, about models that is maximum likelihood. I mean, maximum likelihood is really the, the technique, really, for, for, for doing applications of statistical models. So I, 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 before talk, and maximum likelihood is, is, is a form of Bayes. It's really a large sample. Bayes, when you have large samples, there's a very close connection between maximum likelihood and Bayes. And some of you hopefully know, know, know something about maximum likelihood, I'm sure. You must have been taught it a bit, but just in case, I'm going to talk about the basic ideas of maximum likelihood, what I think are the most important features of maximum likelihood um, to set the stage for, for modeling. Um, the, then I'll, t I'll talk a little bit about the Bayesian approach for, for simple random, random samples, um, and then some basic models for uh, Bayesian models, in particular binomial, um, the bi binomial distribution models, binomial models, where you have a, a binary outcome, just two, two, two outcomes, possible outcomes, um, normal model for, for normal data, um, a bit on non-parametric type models, and uh, ratio regression estimation. Ratio and regression estimates very commonly used in sample surveys. So that, that there really are models underlying those two, two, two approaches to estimation. And so I'll describe that too. Okay, so um, what is different about survey inference? Well, um, I think one thing that's different is that uh, um, we're often focused on making inferences about finite population quantities. So you have a finite population, you have a, the population of, of, of Spain or this region of Spain, and um, you're interested in characteristics of that population um, or, or perhaps subgroups of the population. Um, often we're interested in that too. So there, there's a lot of it that's just estimating means and totals. So what's the average income for people in, in, um, in, a, in Spain, for example? What's the median income? So, some quantity that, uh, that's a finite population quantity. Um, in other kinds of statistics, often we're talking about parameters that are, um, are not specific to a particular finite population. So, so that, 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 that's one feature. Um, and uh, I, th I think Bayes is really uh, very natural for those kinds of problems because um, essentially um, what Bayesian inference does or what model-based inference does is uh, it says that uh, here I have some cases that I've observed, some, a sample from the population, and then I have the non-sample population 
and I'm just trying to fill in a non-sample population. So, I mean, I think everything's a missing data problem, really, because I work on missing data, so I think that everything should be missing data problem. But, I mean, I think that's a very, a, a, a very natural way of thinking about statistics. It's just predicting the uh, part of the population that you don't see. And once you've filled it in, then you can then estimate something, anything you like, from that filled-in population. Um, so, uh, prediction and, and uh, predictive distributions are, are, are the, really how we deal with finite population inference in, in Bayes. Um, I'll talk about this more later, but the design-based approach is very much focused on weighting. So you weight up the cases that you sample to the population. Uh, and, and there are strong, there are some there's some relationships between weighting and, 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 and prediction, but uh, um, I, I like prediction better, actually, and I'll try and explain why. And maybe you'll get the picture. I think, actually, prediction is a more general way of thinking about the problem. It's a better way of thinking about the problem. Actually, I think prediction is, is a good way of thinking about statistics in general. I mean, just about anything in statistics you can think of as being a form of prediction. You have stuff you see, you try and predict the stuff you don't see, and then estimate what you like from it. So it's pretty straightforward, right? Simple, simple way of thinking about things. With estimates of uncertainty, so the, we, we need to, there's uncertainty in the stuff we predict, so we need to reflect that uncertainty with standard errors, confidence intervals, and things like that. Now, in, so people talk about uh, descriptive inference for finite population quantities. Um, they also talk about um, analytic inference in, in the survey world, so um, where um, you're not so much interested in, in, a, in a concrete, uh, in a thing for the finite population, but you're talking about a, a regression coefficient or something that applies more generally beyond the population you're sampling. Um, that's more like a standard statistical, so econometric model, ec economic models don't necessarily relate to an actual value in a finite population. They're, they're, they're parameters, regression coefficients that, that relate to what you might call a superpopulation, something that you, you would think of the population as coming from la some larger sort of infinite, infinite population, and, and then there's a parameter that's part of the model. Um, so we often use Greek, like thetas, or thetas if you're British. And I don't know what they say in Spain. <laughs> what they say in Spain, ladies. <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> Whatever. So, uh, so there's a Greek, these Greek things are supposed to be um, superpopulation parameters um, and then the finite population quantities. In fact, I don't make a huge distinction between um, analytic inference for parameters and um, finite population quantities. Um, I think you can do quite well by just thinking about finite population quantities um, in the survey setting for just about anything. Um, the reason why is that if you have some parameter that's sitting in a model, like a regression coefficient in a multiple regression model, um, then you can imagine if I had the whole population, if I'd sampled everybody and everybody had responded, then I could fit this regression model to the whole population. Right. And if I fitted it by least squares or something, then I'd get an estimate from a population quantity, which would just be the estimate you get by fitting the model to the whole population. Okay, That's what I'm calling theta tilde here. So this theta tilde is the estimate of theta from fitting the model to the whole population. And that's a finite population quantity. It's calculated from the population. And... Uh, and it's a real thing. I mean, even the, the regression, the, the theta is kind of a, 
uh, an imaginary thing that lives with, with inside a model. I mean, if the, if, the, if the regression model is wrong, then what, what does theta mean? I don't know what it means. But theta tilde, this estimate, from fitting the model to the whole population is, is a real finite population quantity that exists whether the model is correct or incorrect. And, uh, and you, if, you, uh, if you just turn the problem into trying to get a good estimate of theta, theta tilde, then uh, a good estimate of theta tilde would be a good estimate of theta. If it's not a good estimate of theta, then I'm not sure what we're estimating. So, um, I, I think that uh, um, whether you're interested in an analytical regression parameter or something, or whether you're in, it, it, you can turn it into a finite population pro problem and, uh, and try and do a good job to estimate the finite theta tilde, the finite population quantity. So, um, uh, so, so, I, so I think the distinction here is it, it matters less to me than it does to some people. So a good estimate of theta should be a good estimate of theta tilde. Otherwise, uh, what are we estimating? Does anybody have any questions? Do you, do people get the idea? People in the front do, at least. So. <laughs> okay. All right, now the other thing that's, so, so, uh, so I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about estimating finite population quantities. Uh, and my point is that even if you're um, interested in analytical quantities, you, you should still think about it, estimating finite population quantities. The uh, second feature of surveys is um, this idea of a complex sample design. So, so um, you know, I, I now actually edit, or ed edit a survey journal, a new, new survey journal, and if you submit a paper to, to, my, to, a, to a survey journal, and, uh, and you just talk about simple random sampling, then, then the, it'll probably get rejected, sent back and said, we're not really interested in simple random sampling, tell me what to do with a complex sample design. So how do I deal with stratification and clustering? I mean, that's sort of a, a fairly key aspect of survey inference now. Um, so uh, we need to account for, we need to somehow have a model that, uh, that uh, takes account of the, uh, these complex design features. Uh, and that, that's something that's pretty distinctive in survey, survey inference. Although actually in other areas of statistics, there are complex design features often. And they're not talked in that way, but I mean, I work in biostatistics, so I work with epidemiologists, and epidemiologists often use clusters they select hospitals and then they sample from hospitals and you know economics too too i mean economists do as well so so the distinction but i mean i guess the survey sampling folks because of the history of survey sampling um a particularly key fit, they they particularly care about this particular aspect of the uh, of the selection of the cases um and uh, I mean, one of the reasons why samplers often, the, the, there's a long history of, uh, of fights between, uh, m between modelers versus design-based statisticians and surveys. And um, one of the reasons why the samplers, I mean, d design-based people reject modeling is uh, is they think the modelers are, 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 should forget about these design features. So they just build a model and they don't care about uh, these design features. And so economists will go, we have, who's an economist here? So really, I want to identify. Okay. okay. Yeah, quite a few. Good. So, so the, the, you know, you give them this complex, this sample, and you tell, and they're told you have to use these design weights, these, these survey weights, and the, the economist doesn't know what they're talking about. I mean, I'm building a model. I don't. Why should I use these weights? I mean, what's that all about? So that so um, um, there is this tendency to um, for the modelers to say that the design doesn't matter that much. 
Oh, I see. She said. So, but but um, I think I should. I'm going to try and convince you as an economist why you should worry about the design weights. But I'm going to come at it from a modelling direction. So, I'm hopefully going to speak your language, maybe. Well, not not Span not in Spanish, but. So I'll, sp I'll speak the economist language a little bit, but in English, so I apologize for that. So actually, my, my main point here is that I think that the design does matter, and I think sampling weights matter too, but I won't necessarily use them the way um, design-based people use them. So. And then uh, um, another aspect uh, that... that uh, is, is a barrier to using models um, in uh, surveys, as in any, any area of statistics, is that um, models are always wrong. So George Box, who is a, one of my favorite statisticians, English statistician who died last year, actually, um, w w has this f phrase, which you may have heard, that all, um, all models are wrong, some models are useful. Right? So, so, um, you know, a model is, an, is a simplification of a population that we know is not correct, right? So, so in that sense, all models are incorrect. Um, but uh, some models are useful. So if you have a careful, carefully considered model, then you can get very good statistical inferences from that model, even though it's wrong. Um, and... Um, so we always need to be careful to, uh, to, to pick good models and, um, and be aware of the fact that models might be wrong and try and, try and check them, look at, looking at um, model checks, like looking at residuals and regression and, and checking the assumptions of regression, things like that. Um, so... Um, so the bottom line for this complex design part of survey inference is that uh, design features like clustering and stratification, weighting, should be incorporated in the model. And um, if you don't, then you can be in trouble. Um, and hopefully I'll give you some ideas as to how I think that should happen so it's not just vague. Um, Actually, this paper here, this Hansen, Maddow, and Tepping, um, is uh, oft, often cited. Um, it's a Journal of the American Statistical Association paper. Morris Hansen was a very prominent American statistician at the Census Bureau. Um, actually, the, others, the other two are prominent, too. Um, and uh, that's often quoted as the, the design-based people's um, reason why they don't like models. Um, I was actually the associate editor on that paper, so actually it was, was uh, instrumental in having it reviewed. So. Okay, now, for those of you who live in uh, um, the world of, of uh, official statistics, um, there is this characteristic of surveys that uh, often you're doing uh, you're in a production environment, so you're actually creating um, statistics um, you know, every month, and you're you're on a um, on a what, what's a you're you, you're continually under the gun. You continually have to produce estimates, and um, and so there's a feeling: can we do statistical modeling? Because this somehow seems like it's a lot of work. I mean, somehow you have to um, look at all these mod models and check them and, and, and understand them. Um, so, uh, so that's one of the arguments that's put up, put up against doing modeling in the, in, in, the, in the official statistics world, at least. Um, so careful modeling is often perceived as too much work in a production environment. And so we just give us the data, we'll weight it up, and then we'll produce these estimates. Um, it's more automated, so there's less thinking. Um, however, I mean, I think even if you're being design-based, then, then there are sort of models lying around, actually. So, um, 
if you have outliers that have high weights and you're doing a design-based thing, then, then those cases will be um, creating a lot of uh, very high variance. Um, so uh, um, some, some attention to the data, I think, is important, whether you're a modeler or whether you're doing design-based inference. Um, and I sort of felt that uh, off-the-shelf kind of standard Bayesian models can be developed um, that incorporate survey to sample design features. Um, a sort of a modeler's version of um, the classic survey text that a lot of people who learn statistics is, is a book by sampling, but by Cochrane, Bill Cochrane, on uh, sampling methods. And uh, so he has chapters on stratification and structures on clustering. Well, there's kind of a moral based version of that, I think. Um, so you could do this um, without uh, building two, using sort of fairly standard models, um, although you should still check them, I think. The Bayesian, the, the Bayesian approach is much more flexible than that, so you can also build very complicated models um, and actually es estimate them now, which you couldn't a few years ago. So there isn't actually a Bayesian software package on survey applications, and that, that would be nice, um, although there's a lot of um, Bayesian software that, that can be used for, in the survey setting. Um, I, I'm hoping in the next few years to, to try and get people at the Institute of Social Research in Michigan to actually develop a, a specific package that says, uh, here, here, here are some Bayesian methods, models to fit for, for surveys. Um, so uh, I'm sorry that I can't say go to Bayesstat, Bayserve, whatever you want to call it, and uh, that will tell you how to do everything. Um, so at the moment, we have to work a little bit harder um, using existing software. Um, but there is a lot of Bayesian software out there, so it's not like it's hopeless. It's not like you have to write your own code to do everything. You just have to know a little bit about how, these, uh, how to apply these models. So I will say more about software later, but uh, um, it's, we're not quite as far along. I mean, actually, it's a little bit like missing data. When I was, uh, I, I've been doing missing data for a long time, and uh, you know, I give it, I, I probably gave my first course on missing data about 25, 20 years ago, and um, I, I've, probably what I was telling people about missing data then um, is sort of what I'm telling you about surveys now. But there's a lot of missing data software now, so. I'm sure in the next uh, 10 years or so there's going to be more software, particularly if people are interested in doing it, somebody will develop software. So I'm sorry I can't have you running things, software, bringing in data sets. You can't do that in a two-day course anyway. But, uh, um, but uh, anyway, so it's going to get better, I think, but uh, there's already quite a lot that you can do. So I, I talked about how um, met models, people don't like, in the survey world, people don't like models because they don't want to make any assumptions. So they want, um, they think that uh, models make assumptions and, uh, and this Bayes thing is even worse because that's, it seems like it's subjective. And uh, we definitely don't want to be subjective if we're in the government setting, for example, or official statistics setting. Um, no, because government agencies rightly need to be viewed as being objective and, and, and not sh and shielded from policy biases. Um, well, actually, there are Bayesian methods that are just as objective as, as, as frequentist methods. It's, it's a matter of degree. I mean, there are models, that, Bayesian methods that have, make fairly strong assumptions, and there are Bayesian methods that make relatively weak assumptions. I mean, for those of you who are in economics, um, there are e econometric models that make very strong assumptions. I mean, the Heckman model for selection bias, some of you may know, um, which I'll talk a little bit about later if I have time. 
um, is making very strong assumptions. Um, so uh, you, I would argue that, that just about any method of statistics makes some kinds of assumptions. It's just that whether those assumptions are really explicit, whether they're actually in front of you, or whether they're buried in the, uh, in the algebra. And one of the things I like about models is that they make the assumptions much more explicit. Um, so, you know, if you're an economist and you don't really care about the details of how these dis posterior distributions are created, um, you know, it really doesn't matter. You just have to focus on the model. What are the assumptions you're making in formulating a model? Um, so I, I, I really view this as a big strength of Bayes, not a weakness. The fact that the assumptions are out there. Um, so, uh, so I think we make assumptions, but then we address, we assess the assumptions and see whether they're reasonable. There's a prior distribution, um, prior distribution, I'd say, <laughs> that uh, uh, that's involved in Bayes. Um, yeah, and in the, in, but that can be um, what's known as a, an informative kind of prior distribution or non-informative. And, and often, in other words, that doesn't really add any, any information. And in, in the government setting, usually we're, we're, we're interested in non-informative, sometimes in its objective bays, probably more than subjective bays. So... Um, my point is that uh, it's Bay Bayes is, um, you know, uses this thing known as subjective probability. It's a subjective um, definition of probability if you're a mathematician. Um, but the, uh, the, the degree of subjectivity varies a whole lot depending on the model. And uh, it's quite easy, quite, quite um, feasible to have models that are relatively just as objective as anything as we do in the design-based approach. And, uh, you know, these uh, um, enlarged samples, um, Bayesian inference um, is often very similar to uh, sort of maximum likelihood type inferences that we do quite a bit anyway. Um, but it also allows us to do, to, do, to do more. So in my mind, it's the most general way of, of doing statistics um, that I know. That sort of works for all problems, although it's not necessarily easy for all problems. But. And um, so uh, if we're talking about maximum likelihood type modeling versus Bayes, then uh, um, I think that um, maximum likelihood, as I'll describe later, um, has very good properties for large samples if you have a lot of data, but it's not so good when you don't have a lot of data. Um, whereas Bayes can fix up the problems of, of uh, maximum likelihood in small samples. So, so it sort of works. So it's kind of like maximum likelihood in large samples, but it does better than maximum likelihood in small samples. So uh, in that sense, it's general in terms of it doesn't require, assume a large sample, really. So the um, other feature, this, I think this is the last one, but the, the other feature of survey inference, inference from sample surveys is, is concern about uh, frequentist properties of the inference. So, the whole idea of design-based inference is you have a confidence interval, and then does that confidence interval include the true value in repeated sampling? So, um, you know, from Neyman's 1934 paper, um, who defined, where he defined the confidence interval, um, there's a lot of interest in, in getting um, interval estimates that, that have this uh, confidence property that that it covers the true parameter in repeated sampling. Um, and I really think this is very, very important, actually. So in that, this sense, I, I, I'm really a frequentist, along with the frequentist. Um, and I'm going to say what I mean by calibrated Bayes, which is um, sort of a, a particular way of looking at Bayes. Um, but essentially, the idea is that uh, 
I, I want, I'm going to do Bayes, so I'm going to use Bayes models, but I hope, I want the answers that come out of these Bayes models to have good frequentist properties. So the, the interval that I get from the Bayesian analysis is a procedure, and you can say, if I repeat that procedure over and over, does it cover the parameter or not? So, so, so Bayes has frequentist properties just as any other kind of procedure does. And uh, I want to choose models that give me good frequentist properties in repeated sampling. So I want to have my cake and eat it, as it would be the English expression. So I want to, because Bayes has, Bayes has all these great properties, optimal properties theoretically. Um, but then it's, if you have a bad model, it gives you a terrible answer. So, so uh, I, want to, I want to have, have all the theoretical properties of Bayes for my inference, but then I wanted to have good frequentist properties as well. And uh, the, uh, um, one of the key ideas to, to get that to work is, is, a, is a, I come back to the idea of including these design features in the model. If you just ignore the design when you're formulating the model, then, then, then that could have very bad frequentist properties, which is sort of the uh, argument that people have made that don't like modeling. So the Hansen Maddow and Tepping paper is sort of essentially not incorporating the design features in the model, which is why it's giving you bad answers in their simulation study. Okay, so that's so those are the five things that I think are different about surveys. Um, does anybody else want to add any other? things that they think are distinctive. I'd love somebody else in the audience to talk rather than just me. I could drone on and on, and you fall asleep. <laughs> okay, anyway, we'll move on for the moment, sir. But hopefully you can think of a question at some point, sir. Maybe at some point I'll just stop unless somebody asks a question. So. Leave. No. All right, so there are these approaches to survey inference. And uh, so people will talk about design based or, or randomization inference um, and uh, superpopulation modeling. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about these different approaches um, in the next few slides. Um, and model, within modeling, there's something that's sort of known as superpopulation modeling. Um, and then there's Bayes. And superpopulation models and Bayes are closely related. They both involve specifying a model for the, for the survey variables. Um, in the superpopulation modeling approach, you ha it's more like sort of classical statistics that we learn. So you have a regression model or something like that. Then you have parameters. But the parameters are treated as fixed. And then you create confidence intervals or tests for null values of parameters. And then you use the classical methods like confidence intervals or hypothesis testing, right? So that's, so superpopulation modeling is sort of more like kind of standard modeling that you, I mean, if you're, for the economists, that's kind of what you'd learn in the econometric, in the, in the econometric uh, statistics course. Um, but it's sort of, it's, it's kind of a mixture because the, there's a model there, but then the parameters are treated as fixed. So it's sort of frequentist inference for the parameters. You're looking at repeated sampling where, where the, the, the underlying population parameters are treated as fixed. Whereas in Bayesian modeling, you would basically add a prior distribution for the uh, parameters and uh, use Bayes' theorem to generate the uh, um, inference about the parameters. And uh, so I think super pop superpopulation models are super, but Bayes is better. I, I don't know how that translates into Spanish, but maybe there's a Spanish version of that. I don't know. <laughs> OK, so what is design-based inference? So we have some design variables. Um, that uh, the, the, this Z thing over here, so, or Z as we say in English, 
is uh, um, we have a finite population here, and we have, these are things that we, are, we know for everybody in the population. Um, so these are design things that we have before we actually collect the sample. So I'm going to call that, I'll use, try and use English. So I'll try, try and go back to my English days. I, 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 was, um, I was born in England, actually, and raised in Scotland. Um, but I now live in the States. So, so um, when I'm in the States, I will say Z. But uh, since I'm in Europe, I'll try and say Z. Okay, so, so we have Z, which is the design variables. And then we have some of these guys get included in the sample and some of them are not included. So I is an indicator for which units in the uh, population are being included and which are not being included in the sample. Right, so that's I. And, and one running from 1 to N, capital N is the population size. And so there are capital N units in the population. So then there are values of Y for everybody in the population. So that's Y1 up to YN. But we only see, let's see, is this working? We only see um, Y for the cases in the sample. So I'm going to write Y inc for, the, for this stuff over here, this, the people we actually see in the population, in the sample, sample values, and Y ex or for excluded for the uh, non sampled values. So Y ex are the non sampled values of the survey variables. And this will depend on I, notice, because it depends on who's being included right, in the survey. Now, the point about the design-based approach is that uh, it's, um, the Y values, the population values, are actually not given any kind of a distribution. They're just treated as fixed numbers. Right? And uh, the random variable in the design-based approach is the inclusion indicator. It's, it's the thing that determines what's in or out. This is actually kind of a little strange because in most of statistics, um, I mean, e econ economics, you, you have a model for why. Right? So there's a distribution being specified for the survey variables. So if you have income, you have some regression for income. You have a regression model for income, so why uh, are, are random variables? It, it, and that's true for most areas of statistics. But in this survey sampling design-based approach, um, the Y is not going to be given a distribution at all. Uh, and survey samplers like that because they don't want to make any assumptions. So if you don't make any assumptions, you just treat these as fixed numbers. Right? It's a little bit like randomization inference in, 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 in experimental design, where you, you randomize who, who gets which treatment. That's sort of the other area of randomization inference, but it's not used so much these days. Um, whereas this design-based approach in surveys is, is used all the time. Okay, so we're trying to estimate something. So Q is a finite population quantity, the thing, the target parameter, ta target quantity, I should say. This is the finite population quantity that I'm interested in. And in general, it will depend on Y and, and Z, so it could depend on stress strata, for example, we look at, would be interested in the mean within strata, something like that. Um, and then in the design-based approach, we then get an estimate of Q we, from somewhere. Sometimes it's a little bit unclear with it where this estimate comes from, but uh, we have an estimate that we like for, for Q, that it has some property, which I'll describe later. So anyway, we come up with a Q hat, which obviously only depends on the things we can actually see. So we can see, we know what, what I is, we know what Y inc is, we know what Z is, but we don't know Y x. So this only involves the stuff we actually see. Then we have an estimate of the variance of Q, um, which is the sample estimate of the variance of, of, of Q hat. And then we, we get a confidence interval so if you're a 95% confidence interval, we just use the estimate plus or minus 1.96 standard errors, or two standard errors if you don't care. 
1.96 sounds like two. I don't know what you use here. The Census Bureau in the States, they use a 90% confidence interval. So they use one point, plus or minus 1.645 standard errors. Uh, 1.96 comes from the normal distribution, right? It's the 97.5 percentile of the normal. 1.645 is the, is the 95th percentile of the normal. So you put 5% in each tail, you get a 90% confidence interval. So that's kind of design-based in inference in, a, uh, in one slide. Does it sound right? Okay, so what drives um, the inference here is not a model for Y. What drives it is, is the distribution of I. That's, that's where the randomness is coming from. So clearly, how, I get, how people get selected here is very central to design-based inference. Um, and uh, um, we only know the distribution of I if we have a random sample. So random sampling is really very central to uh, this approach to survey inference. And, and random sampling is characterized by the following two properties. So every pro possible sample, at least in theory, has a known chance of being selected. And every unit in the sample has a non-zero chance of being selected. So nobody gets excluded with probability one. Everybody has some chance of coming into the sample. And every possible sample has a known chance of being selected. So that's actually the definition of probability sampling. It's clearly more general than simple random sampling so I went the wrong way. Um, simple random sampling um, with replacement, um, all possible samples of size n have the same chance of being selected. Actually, this is without replacement. I think this is a mistake. This is simple random sampling um, without replacement. Maybe you could change that with to with that. So. Um, here's the distribution. So every n choose n, here's the number of ways we can choose a sample of size little n from a population of size capital N. Um, so this is some number. And then every sample, so this is the number of possible samples we have, simple random samples of size n if we do it without replacement. Um, then the, all of these samples have the same probability, so the, the probability of selecting any of them is one over n choose n, um, if, the, if the sample size is n. So if the, total, the sum of i sub i over, over all the population units is uh, little n, uh, that is the sample size is little n, then, then all those samples have the same probability. If, uh, if, if the sum isn't n, so if it's, n if it's different from n, then there's no probability, because we were sampling for a particular size, little n, so restricting samples to samples that have a little n. So this is a formalization. So this is a distribution of i for simple random sampling without replacement. And a uh, little bit of math shows that uh, the expected value of i sub i, which is the probability that unit i is selected, um, is just little n over capital N. So if you take a sample of size 15 out of 100, the probability of select being selected is 15%, 15 over 100, so very simple. And, and, and a, 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 there's a big, there's a problem actually that, that a lot of people think probability sampling is simple random sampling. So um, the whole history of survey sampling is basically getting away from this way of doing it because in pra practice you can't take a simple random sample of Spain. It doesn't work. We don't have, a, don't have the information that allows us to do that 
really. So uh, um, a lot of the magic in survey sampling is getting is doing other kinds of probability samples, but which I'll talk about later. But for the moment, I'm going to focus on on simple random sampling and talk about um, doing inference for from simple random samples. So we have, for example. Um, suppose the quantity that we're interested in is the population mean, so it's for a variable y, so we have the sum of yi from i equals 1 up to capital M, it's the, the population total divided by the, the population size, capital N, is the uh, population mean, that's the thing we're trying to get an estimate of. If you do a simple random sample, then we'll, we'll, we'll generally use the sample mean to estimate the population mean. So uh, Q hat, which uh, now depends on the sample, is uh, um, the sample mean, which can be written like this. So you have the sum over the population. You take the indicator, which picks out the sampled cases, and then divide that by little n. So that's then the sample mean. So that's our estimate. That's the Q hat. Um, and uh, the point about the design-based approach is that uh, i sub i is the random variable here. So remember that that's kind of weird, that the y's are just c considered to be fixed numbers here. They don't have any kind of a distribution. It's the i sub i that's the random variable. Um, and uh, if you look at repeated sampling, if you take, ex if you take ex the expectation of uh, Q hat, the expectation of Y bar over the uh, samples, then uh, then it's unbiased. So you can use the, the expected value of this with respect to I, which is the random variable, is just uh, what well, it's the expected value of I sub I is just little n over capital N. So a little bit of algebra, you get the population mean out of the n. So this is very simple algebra. So one reason for taking the sample mean here is it's an unbiased estimator of the population mean. I mean, any of you who've had a course in sampling will, will have seen this, I'm sure of it. And then uh, you can do, uh, you can calculate the variance of y bar i over the distribution of i, uh, y bar, sorry, the sample mean has a variance o over the distribution of i that uh, looks like this. This is the population variance of uh, y. And um, this thing in red, 1 minus little n over capital N, is the finite population correction. So this actually means that as you take the whole population where little n is equal to capital N, the variance goes to 0, because then we've, we've got everybody. So this is the, the allowance for the fact that I'm interested in the finite population mean rather than some superpopulation parameter. So we have to estimate this. We don't, know, we don't know the population variance. We have to estimate it. So we estimate that with the sample variance, which is the same thing estimated on the sample. Um, that gives us a, the estimate of the variance. And then... Uh, and then we get a 95% confidence interval. So that's sort of chapter one of any design-based sampling text. So um, I'm sure a lot of you have, know all about this. Where does the normality come in here? So, why, why can I say this is a normal distribution? I'm going to ask you a question now because I want to stop talking. Anybody tell me why? Where does normality come from? Yes. I don't know. Do I take this off or what? Yes. Where? <laughs> Not sure how this. Ah, oh, we have mics. Okay. Excellent. El teorema central del límite. Yeah, that's right, central limit theorem. Yes, as we say in English, yes. Yep, correct. 
So the me so there's no there's no distribution for y, but the the the, the mean of y has this tends to normality by the central limit theorem, right? But notice it, it it's it, 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 I'm going to call this it's it's a large sample inference here. Um, if I had a small sample, what would I be doing? Can I, somebody answer that? How would I change this if I had a small sample? If I was to assume normality. Let's see, what, do we have to bring the, so you have to li raise your hand and bring the mic round, is that how that works? I don't know. Who's got the, who wants to answer that, sir? Podría querer utilizar la desigualdad de Chebyshev o algún método no paramétrico. Okay, but suppose I want to, suppose I just want to assume normality here, so I don't want to be a parametric. I use the T distribution, right? So, so I, I change this 1.96 to a T percentile. That's, that's, the, that's the normal thing. So. But there's no, there's no T distribution coming out of this approach. Because t dis the two t distribution requires a, I, I make an, a modeling assumption. I have to assume normality. If the y values are not normal, then there's nowhere to get a t out of this theory. Which is what, why I would call this a large sample theory. It doesn't really have small sample stuff. To be small sample, you really have to put a distribution on y. That's not to say we don't use T distribution. I mean, when we do the inference, we'll use the T, but we're, we're relying on some distributional assumption when we do that. So it's sort of interesting in some ways. But, but we're really modeling, actually. I don't know if anybody read Neyman's. There's this Neyman 34 paper, which is the, the Bible of survey sampling. Um, it's interesting that Neyman, um, his first example, he actually uses the t-distribution, even though the, uh, uh, the randomization doesn't give you the t-distribution. So in fact, it's a lot of that is actually population, superpopulation modeling, even though he doesn't describe it as a model. So. All right, so there's the Horvitz-Thompson estimator. So this is the standard sort of weighting thing so this is a, a second example. <clears throat> so we have uh, a population, suppose we're interested in the total, y1 up to yn. Uh, so now we're looking at a total. Um, and uh, we have now, uh, we don't have a simple random sample anymore necessarily. We have a, a sample where the probability that uh, unit i is included is pi sub i. Right? So pi sub i is the probability of inclusion. And, and because it's a probability sample, this is positive. So everybody has some chance of being included, but uh, not necessarily the same chance. The Horvitz-Thompson estimator then um, sums over, picks out the sampled values, sigma i, i, y, i. So it's picking out here the cases that are sampled, and then weights them by the inverse of the selection probability. Right? So that's weighting design-based weighting. Um, and uh, so this is a very general way of estimating a, to a total that's known as the Horvitz-Thompson estimator. And uh, it has a general, it has an unbiasedness property. The unbiasedness property is that uh, on the average, um, when I take the expectation of, of II, so it's being design-based again, notice the Ys are fixed. It's the Is of the random variable then this, this is unbiased for the total. Then I have some estimate of the variance, which depends on the design, and I'm not going to specify here, but then the, the confidence interval is just the estimate plus or minus two standard errors again, or 1.96 standard errors. <coughs> so this is unbiased under, under essentially very minor assumptions. So it's very, uh, um, if you like, well, 
it doesn't make strong assumptions. It's not a one. It's not perfect, though. Um, if you do systematic sampling, so a lot of people in auditing settings, um, you sample with probability proportional to size. You take a list, you then order the list and their sizes, and then take a systematic sample. Um, there isn't actually a way of estimating the variance from that. Under this approach, you have to make an assumption. So sometimes the variance is, is not very easy um, for some common designs. Um, but the, uh, um, it can do very badly. So um, the, uh, there are some situations where the, the, the Horvitz-Thompson estimator is a, is, a, is a terrible estimator and has, has horrible confidence properties. So it doesn't have all the nice frequentist things. And I don't know, how many of you know, uh, anybody know Basu's example? So, raise your hand if you know Basu's ele elephant's example. So. so some people do, but it, it seems like it's a minority unless people are being very shy. So, so I'll, I'll talk about Basu's example since. So he had this very amusing example um, about weighing elephants in a herd. So. He has uh, um, a, a, a population of 50 elephants in the circus, and uh, he wants to estimate the weight of the herd. Maybe he's shipping the, they're going on the road, and they have to know how heavy a truck they need to contain all these elephants or something. So he's trying to estimate the total weight of the, these elephants. But uh, the, the circus owner is very cheap. So he's only going to allow you to weigh one elephant. So the sample is, has size one. So there's one elephant that you can weigh. So little n is one, capital N is 50. <coughs> and um, so the circus trainer, who's sort of a, has a certain amount of what we'd say common sense. So he says, well, let's pick the middle elephant. Um, Sambo was the middle elephant in the herd. And um, you know we'll weigh, we'll weigh him, and then we'll, we'll uh, weigh Sambo, and then we'll multiply that by 50. <clears throat> but the circus statistician, who's design-based statistician, ba Basu is kind of a modeler, um, and uh, he was actually very theoretical. He didn't really know much about real statistics, I don't think, but he was a very funny, clever guy, mathematician. Um, he said, uh, well, that's not a probability sample, right? So we can't just pick Sambo, that's, an, that's not a probability sample. We have to take, have some probabilities of selection in there, so. Um, but he quite likes the idea of taking Sambo, so he says, well, we'll make it as a probability sample, so we'll select Sambo with probability 0.99, so 99 out of 100 times we'll pick Sambo, and then we'll, d we'll, we'll take the rest of the probability and throw that over the other 49 elephants. So the other, one of the other, other elephants gets picked with probability 1 over 4,900, right? so that the probability is sum to 1. Okay, so um, the circus trainer thinks this is a little bit strange thing to do, but, well, this guy's an expert, so we'll do what he says. So. So they do flip the coin, and uh, and sure enough, Sam Sambo comes up as the as the one that gets selected. So they actually pick up. They actually pick Sambo. <coughs> so then the trainer says, "Okay, so that Sambo's weight was so many kilos. So the total weight of the herd must be uh, Sambo's weight multiplied by 50, right? Because there are 50 elephants." Right? Well, that's not the Horvitz-Thompson estimator. The Horvitz-Thompson estimator says um, there's only a sample size one here, so, so we just take Sambo's weight and divide that by its probability of selection. And so the estimate of the total is Sambo's weight divided by 0.99. The trainer says that's completely crazy. That's basically Sambo's weight. That's not the weight of the whole herd. 
that's just essentially a little bit point one percent more than Sambo's way. How can that be the estimate of the total of the herd? You got you are really crazy. But then he says, well, what if you picked somebody else, one of the other elephants? Well, in that case, you take the other elephant's weight and multiply that by its probability, divide it by its probability selection, which is 1 over 4,900. So 4,900 times the weight of that, that, that elephant. Well, that's completely ridiculous. I mean, that's huge. This, the thing is only 50. And I'm, take, and I'm multiplying it by 4,900. Well, on the average, this is a perfectly wonderful estimate, right? So, because it's unbiased, so sometimes you get this huge thing, sometimes you get this small thing, but on the average, you get the, the, it's unbiased for the total. So, uh, so the Horvitz-Thompson estimator in this uh, example is always ridiculous, always crazy but it's unbiased on average. So it just shows you that unbiasedness on average is not necessarily a particularly great property, particularly in small samples. And so Basu says, circus, circus statistician loses job and becomes a, an academic statistician, according to Basu. So. Leslie Kish had a, had a different way of interpreting this, but can't remember what he said in one of his papers. But. Now, in fact, um, there's there's an explanation for this example, which is to look at the look at the model. That there's a model implied in the Horvitz-Thompson estimator, and uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And and the reason why this is a stupid estimator is because it's a ridiculous model. So this sort of comes to the idea of models. So um, I'm treating these y's as being fixed. But in fact, when I pick the estimator, I'm really picking, there's a model. There is a model underlying. It's just not really, you're not really telling me what it is. So, so um, models are used in the design-based approach to motivate the choice of estimator. For example, um, we talked about Cochrane's book talks about the regression estimator. Well, there's a regression model underlying the regression estimator. It's not the formal basis of the inference, but it is how the estimator gets picked. There's an underlying model. And the ratio model leads to the ratio estimator. And actually, I haven't written this down, but the Horvitz-Thompson model leads to the Horvitz-Thompson estimator leads to, in a sense, that these models would give you predictions for the non-sample values that, that lead to the estimator when you average over the observed and predicted values. In fact, um, people do cleverer things now than they used to, so there's this generalized regression estimator. Who's heard of GREG? Raise your hand if you know what GREG is. Do you know? You're nodding, but you don't raise your hand. So. GREG, is anybody? If you're, I bet you if you're, if you're working in the, with Christina here that you'll know what GREG is because in, in, in survey agencies, government agencies, people use GREG all the time. Am I, I know they do, yeah. Is that right? Am I right? So what is GREG, generalized regression estimation? Well, you use a model, you then uh, get the predictions from the model, but then uh, you essentially add on weighted residuals. You take the residuals from the model and weight them, and, um, or something like that. And, and this, ca ca this is sometimes called calibration in, 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 in the uh, survey world. Um, so uh, um, this adding on this residual protects against misspecification of the model. So it's still a large sample, but consistent. It's not. It's as large, approximately unbiased, even if the model is wrong. So uh, um, 
Carl Eric Sandal, who was actually at the meeting in Manchester that I was just at, so he was there, um, is sort of probably the main person that started this 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 idea, and he has various there, there are books on GREG. So this this is using a model a lot. So it's using a model for predictions, but then it's still design based because the the standard error is still based on the on the design, and and, and formally it's just another way of getting an estimator. It's, it's still design based really. And, and and people in the survey world will use the term model assisted for that. So. Design, it's design based, but it, it's model assisted in the sense that it uses the model to generate these predictions. Well, in a way, I think sort of any any design based method is really model assisted because there's sort of some model lying around there. Um, okay, so that's design based. Um, Model-based approaches um, use models as the basis for the entire inference. So I write down a model for y, um, and then predict the non-sample values, and then that gives me the estimator, and then I get estimates of uncertainty, like confidence intervals, standard errors. So the model is used, statistical model is the basis for the entire inference. Um, this approach is more unified in my view, and I'll, I'll, when I talk about limitations of the design-based approach, um, I'll say more about this, but es essentially, let me say to start with, that the, the design-based approach at some level works um, if you have large samples, but, but it doesn't do a very good job for small samples. So. Or, and it doesn't do a very good job if you don't have a random sample. So with survey non-response, you don't have a random sample anymore. The people that choose to respond are not a random sample of anybody. So um, if you have non-response in your survey, in some sense, you can't really apply the design-based approach. Well, you can pretend you have a probability sample. That's, so that's what people do, is we pretend we do have a probability sample. Um, Quasi-randomization, you might call that. Um, but that's an assumption. Um, for small area estimation, the, uh, um, this, you really can't do anything without the model because the um, small areas, um, you don't get enough precision. Um, so when Christina said that, that the Bayesian approach can do, do more in small samples, that's because the the design-based approach doesn't give you enough efficiency in small samples. The variance is too large, basically. So you make some assumptions, and certainly you're relying a bit on assumptions here, but, but then you can get more precision by being model-based. And But now for this, this to work, for these models to work, um, as I said before, we need to incorporate these sample design features and I'll say more about that later. So um, people talk about GREG and, and, and actually the standard design-based approach as being design-based model assisted. I tend to think of this as a model-based design assisted. <laughs> so it's the other way around. Um, design assisted in the sense that, uh, that you need to incorporate the design in, in picking the model. And uh, there are two variants of uh, the model-based approach. There's superpopulation modeling, which is the, uh, the prevalent approach to uh, the usual approach to doing um, um, m modeling in the survey setting. Um, or there's Bayes, or if you like, full probability modeling. So that's which is what I'm going to focus on here. And as I, as I mentioned already, the uh, common theme of both of these approaches is to predict the cases that are not sampled or, or the people that don't respond as well. So non-response can be included as, as a prediction. So, so this approach leads naturally to imputation as a way of dealing with missing data. So, 
So uh, what's superpopulation modeling? Um, well, now I have uh, a model for Y. So this is a, a distribution density, if you like, for Y, or a distribution function for Y, um, like a normal distribution with some mean variance, as a simple case, um, for Y. So how, uh, and, and the, an important feature here is that this, this distribution conditions on the design variable Z, the Zs that I had before. So I have the same setup as before for the data. Oops, sorry, I went too far. This is what I see. I see I have design variables. I have the observed part of Y, uh, the, the excluded part of Y. Um, but now I have a model for Y given Z, uh, Z, sorry. Theta are fixed parameters in this, in this model, the means and the variances and so on. And uh, I can get predictions of the non-sampled values of y. Um, so, I mean, we do this in, in statistics a lot. I mean, suppose, you, suppose z was a set of co... z... z was a set of covariates. <laughs> uh, uh, and y is uh, the, the survey variable. I could do a regression of y on, on z get the predictions from that regression, and then use those predictions to, to, to predict the non-sample values. So this is just using regression as prediction, just standard statistics. Right. Actually, I'm going to say it, I'm not actually going to predict the non-sample values by, by, by their conditional means. I'm actually going to take a, uh, a draw um, from the distribution. Um, but we'll do that later. That's not, what, that's not what happens in this approach. So then you have an estimate of Q, which is just based on the, uh, either the observed sample values or the predicted value if, if you're not sampled. Um, that's our estimate. And then we have, actually technically we have to estimate a mean square error here. The variance um, doesn't do enough, but there's some estimate of precision um, of uh, the Q hat, and then I use the 95% confidence interval as before. <coughs> so uh, I'm skipping over a lot of details here, but, but, the, but the, the, the main point here is that with superpopulation modeling, um, it's the prediction of the non-sample values that uh, is, is the key here. The, uh, um, the other point is that the, the thetas here, the, fi the parameters of the model are actually being replaced by estimates, um, which is kind of a frequentist idea, sort of what we do in regression if, if we're being dis uh, a frequentist. So, uh, I mean, a very simple sort of dichotomy is the design-based approach is sort of into weighting, whereas the modeling approach is kind of into prediction. Now, GREG does a bit of both, so GREG involves prediction and weighting. But, but uh, the central idea of the design-based approach, in my view, is, is, is weighting up the cases. So weighting the sample, the weight for a sample case is how many cases in the population that that case is representing, or that unit is representing. All right, so that's superpopulation modeling. Um, Bayesian modeling is, is similar to that. So we still have a model for Y, um, but now we put a prior distribution on the parameters. So um, we have this prior distribution for theta that uh, comes into the model. And then inference about theta is based on the posterior distribution from Bayes' theorem. So Bayes' theorem basically says, and this is just a, a, a simple theorem in probability, that says that uh, the, the dis distribution of theta given y inc is equal to the prior is proportional to the prior distribution of theta multiplied by the likelihood function. Um, 
So this model for y given z gives us a likelihood function, which is basically the density of y treated as a function of theta. And I'll talk about that likelihood a lot more later. But, but think of this as just being the distribution of, of, y, of, of y inc given z, um, but regarded as a function of theta. Um, then uh, p of uh, theta given y inc is just proportional to p of theta times, times the likelihood. I can't draw, can I? No. Probably so. No, I guess I'll just leave it like that. Where does this come from? The joint distribution of theta and y inc can be written as the marginal of theta times the conditional of y inc or the uh, marginal of y inc times the conditional of theta given y inc. And that's just using that just manipulating that expression gives us Bayes' theorem. So Bayes' rule, if you like, it's 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 hardly a theorem. It's just 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 probability, really. So it's interesting. The essence of Bayes is ridiculously simple. What about the population quantity? So this is, for, this is the posterior distribution here, which is the distribution of theta given what we observe, z and y inc, um, gives us inference about uh, theta. Um, so it's a distribution, so we can then estimate the mean of the distribution is the estimate, and uh, the var variance of the distribution is a measure, measure of precision. Um, so we, everything's based essentially on the, uh, on, on the posterior distribution of theta. What about a finite population quantity? So if we have Q of Y, um, we need uh, the posterior distribution of Q of Y given the observed data. That should, that should have a Z in there, actually. There should be a Z. There's a Z that's missing in that expression. So, um, so that's called the posterior predictive distribution of uh, Q. Um, so inference about theta is based on the posterior distribution of theta. Uh, inference about Q, the finite population quantity, is based on the posterior predictive distribution of Q. Um, and that can be obtained. This is the posterior distribution of Q. You can see there's a Z here. That, sh that Z, Z should be there too as well. This posterior predictive distribution can be obtained by first conditioning on theta and then averaging over the posterior distribution of theta. So you can think of theta as being kind of new, what we, we might call nuisance parameters here. We're not really, if we're interested in the finite population quantity, the theta is just a, an intermediate step to get to the posterior predictive distribution of Q. And, and often it, this means uh, we, we kind of do this um, integration numerically um, in a lot of applications of Bayes to surveys. Um, but uh, this is sort of the underlying mathematical expression. So you can estimate theta and, and then you estimate a posterior distribution for theta and then that gives you the posterior predictive distribution of Q. So, in the superpopulation modeling approach, parameters are considered fixed and estimated. So, we estimate the parameters theta. Um, in the Bayesian approach, the parameters are random, and they're integrated out of the posterior distribution to get uh, inference for finite population quantities. Now, this calculus here, this integrating over theta, um, is really why Bayes is great. Um, because um, the process of integrating over the posterior distribution propagate, it, it allows for the uncertainty in estimating theta in a way that superpopulation modeling approach doesn't, often doesn't do a good job of. Bayes tends to do better, which is why Bayes tends to give you better small sample inferences. Um, now, a lot of people don't like integrating over nuisance parameters because 
that means you have to put a distribution on them. So people don't want to put a prior distribution on a parameter because they, they think a parameter should, should be fixed. Parameters are fixed, why should I give it a distribution? Well, the Bayesian perspective is that anything that's unknown, you give it a distribution. And once you've given it a distribution, you can integrate over it. Um, now, a lot of classical statistics is trying to get around putting a distribution on theta because we don't want, they don't want to put a distribution on theta. But I can tell you, if you put a distribution on unknowns, it makes everything much simpler. So I'm a very simple person, simple-minded person. So I just like putting distribution on and be done with it. And if you know the name Dennis Lindley, so Lindley was a very famous, uh, somewhat cranky English statistician um, who died actually, he died last year, actually, uh, Lindley. He had a big gray, long gray hair, and he's funny, funny, great bit, old beard. He's in, he was 90, I think, or early 90s. And um, I, was, I was at a, um, a lecture when I was a PhD student at Imperial College London, and um, that, a guy called Edwards was giving a, uh, a talk about likelihood. So the likelihood guys, uh, or, 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 or girls, their idea is to base inference on the likelihood, but we don't put a, want to put a prior distribution and be Bayesian. We just want to use the likelihood as the basis for inference. And uh, you have to be very clever if you're just using the likelihood much cleverer than I was. So. Anyway, he gives this series of lectures about likelihood. He wrote a book, actually, about AWF Edwards about likelihood. And at one point, I remember Lindley got up and he said, excuse me, Dr. Edwards, so this is all very interesting, this likelihood stuff, but um, if you just add in a prior distribution on theta, everything becomes much simpler. So eventually, you'll just end up being a Bayesian. So. And uh, well, Edwards, State, remained a likelihood person, so he did. But it, but I became a Bayesian eventually. I didn't even know what Bayes was at that point. But but it, it really uh, um, there are two reasons why you should be a Bayesian. One is that it makes life much simpler. Um, you have to worry about how you choose that prior distribution. I mean, it's not there. There is. It's not. You shouldn't be automatic. There's some thought required in the prior. But, uh, but it makes life a lot easier and actually does, gives you better answers at the end, I can tell you. Okay, so this is just an overview. So it's, it's 50,000 meters high at this point. I'm not, I'm, I'll give you specific examples later. So, uh, if you're trying to summarize um, design-based versus, I'm going to take my glasses off. Well, maybe not. I can't see. I used to get by without glasses until recently, but I'm getting very old. Um, so the summary of the design-based approach is that uh, um, you avoid having to model the survey outcomes. Um, it, it tends, if you have a probability sample and if you have a large sample, it tends to work pretty well. Um, but it's limited because models are needed for, um, for non-response, for response errors, and for small areas. So, so basically what people do in, in, in government, government statistics these days is for, for some problems they're design-based. So for large samples, estimating means and totals and things, but then when you go to non-response, or whether you go to small area estimation, you become model-based. Basically because you can't be design-based for small areas because you don't get enough precision. So um, models, are needed, models are needed for better precision in, in small samples. So I've written a little bit about this, and, and I, I call it inferential schizophrenia. So, um, and it leads to some odd kinds of things. So, this is my enomometer. This is the sample size sitting up here. And um, 
So if the sample size is large, we're going to do design-based inference. But when the sample size gets small, we do model-based inference. So logically, there's somewhere in between where we're, des we're design-based up here and we're model-based down there, so in principle. So I call that the point of inferential schizophrenia because right? it splits between the two ways of doing statistics. So how do I choose this point of inferential schizophrenia? And if it's 35, then uh, should I do some change my complete philosophy of statistics when n equals 34 and n equals 36? In fact, um, it's actually even worse because the, the confidence interval for n equals 34 is based on the model because I'm being model-based, and that's going to be narrower than the confidence interval for n equals 36, where I'm being design-based. So here I have a smaller confidence interval when the sample size is actually, uh, actually smaller, which is, is, should be the other way around. I mean, your confidence interval should get bigger as your sample size gets smaller. But uh, because of this inferential schizophrenia, there's an inconsistency, really. I mean, it's in the brain. I mean, we don't really think about this in practice, but but it bothers me as a con conceptual point of view. This 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 is a little bit, I think, a little bit problematic. I would say. I know what you think. Now, if you're modeling about everything here, then then this becomes much more much nicer, as I, I think I'll show you later. I think I have a slide with the model-based approach here. So some other issues. So it's kind of large sample method, design-based approach. And, and the, the other thing is that in probability, it was based on when you could do probability sampling, but we don't have probability samples anymore. It's a problem. Non-response, non-contact, it's harder and harder to get hold of people. They don't want to respond to surveys. Um, so uh, non-response rates are going up. Um, you know, no, everybody has cell phones. They don't have they don't have uh, phones in the house, so we can't we can't find them on the cell phone. So uh, um, and it's more in expensive too. So face-to-face -face interviewing, which might solve some of this, is very expensive. And then uh, I don't know about you guys, but in other parts of the world, everybody's interested in big data now. So, big data is going to solve our problems. So, we'll, we, why should you collect your survey because we can find this stuff on the internet or administrative records or whatever? So, so um, big data is the flavor of the month, as we say. It's it's very popular. Well, you can't really do big data from a design-based perspective. It just doesn't work because a lot of the big data really have nothing to do with the probability sample. It's just whoever happens to be doing Facebook or whatever. So, um, you know, uh, I mean, a part of the issue, I mean, there are two big issues with big data with, with government agencies. One, one is that um, they're trained in the design-based approach, but it design-based approach just doesn't work for big data. So that's a problem. Um, and then there's to change, I mean, it's very hard to change things in government agencies. I mean, I spent a couple of years at the Census Bureau in, in, in the States. I mean, it's a huge organization. Trying to turn that ship around is very, very tricky. It takes a long time. So, And, and of course, government agencies tend to be very conservative and not want to change. So, so it's, it's tricky. It's very difficult. But it actually makes government statistics really a fascinating area to be in now. So I think it's much more intellectually interesting now than, than in the days where everybody just waited up their data. So, uh, so it's challenging, but I think it's also a very interesting time. So, uh, so some advantages of the Bayesian approach. The, 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 uh, I think the main advantage of Bayes is, is, it, is it create, it's a single unified approach that will, will solve, or in principle, 
will solve all problems. It might give you a terrible answer. You have to be careful. You have to, you have to be careful how you apply it. But um, if you apply it well, I think it solves, it does well for probability samples, it does well for large samples, it does well for small samples, it does well for response error, it does well for combining data sources, data fusion, which is a big issue, you know, with big data. The, the way forward is going to have to be combining data from probability samples with, uh, with this administrative data to get a, co a combined inference. That has to be the way we go forward. Um, Bayes is the right framework for thinking about how to do that. Um, you can't do that from the design-based framework. Um, so big data as well. Um, now you could be superpopulation modeling and that will do quite well um, if, you're, if you have large samples, but it doesn't do so well in small samples. So Bayes will also deal with small area estimation. Um, and, and, and if it's done well, um, will give you good design-based properties as well. So it will be good from a frequentist point of view as well. But you have to have models, in my view. So, uh, so you have to pick caref models carefully, carefully to do this. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily all that easy, but, uh, but I do have some ideas about how to do modeling that gives you good answers. The other thing I, which I think, uh, I mean, we have a lot of, we have certainly have economists, economists in the room. I don't know if we have other, like demographers. I don't know if there are any, any demographers here. Or, well, I think we're mainly, it seems like the, the science guys here are mainly economists, people. Um, I, I think if you approach everything from a modeling perspective, then um, it, uh, it, it's easier for communicating with, with economists. So I'm a statistician. Um, I don't know a whole lot about eco economics, but I know something about modeling, and I know economists model. I know they write down e economic models. So I can talk to them about models, um, whereas if you're being design-based, you know, there's the economist is building their models, and then the statistician comes in with these sample weights, this design-based, it's a completely different way of thinking about statistics. So they talk by each other. I've seen this happen at the census. So uh, why should I use the survey weights? I don't understand this design-based approach. So if you do everything as modeling, then I think I, I can think I can t explain to an economist why you might want to use the design weights. Um, in fact, maybe I'll try and do that later. So we'll see. But I'm, I'm, I'm talking generally at the moment. So I, I think having a design-based paradigm for surveys um, is confusing to people that model in, in, in substantive dif disciplines like economics. <coughs> Actually, this is a picture that I have in, in, what, in a paper that I wrote a few years ago, and I think it might be one of the papers that was distributed. Um, sometimes I switch the pictures around, uh, uh, and I have the, the man and, and the woman on opposite sides, since this, the pictures look a little, I'm being insulting to the design-based people here. But. So, uh, so this is this is a government agency, and the the, the design-based statistician is following my design-based statistical standards. When I was at the bureau, I was actually in charge of the statistical standards, um, which is a bit like putting a bull in charge of the china shop, as we say in England. Um, but anyway. Uh, the, des the standards for statistics are often based on design-based ideas. Um, but the, here's the, the economist here saying, I don't care about your design-based methods. I, do, I build models, that's what I do. So. And, and this thing, this is the Bayes frequentist gorilla sitting in the back. So we don't see the Bayes frequentist gorilla, but that's really the, why they're talking by each other, in my view. So model, uh, models will bring survey in inference closer to the statistical mainstream. Um, in particular to application areas. Now there, actually it's nearly, nearly time for a break, so. So there are challenges to the model-based perspective um, and uh, there is an explicit dependence on the choice of model 
Uh, and, uh, and as I say, models have, have subjective elements to them, but the assumptions are, are explicit, so, so you, can, uh, you can evaluate the assumptions. The, the main thing that's, that's bad about models is that bad models give you bad answers. So um, misspecification of models is, is, is justifiably a concern. Um, and I've said this a lot, but one way to, to address this concern is to, is to include the design features in the model, and I'll talk about that in, in, the, in, in the next, next, probably tomorrow, actually. Um, it could be work um, in that you need models for all the survey variables, and, 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 and to do good models, you have to understand the data. Now, Actually, I think that might not be such a bad thing. Um, actually, I really like the economist at the Census Bureau, um, um, and uh, um, one of the things they tell me is that it, these statisticians are very frustrating because they don't pay any attention to the data. I mean, they have all their weights and things, but they don't really care about the data. Um, I think whereas their, their, their perspective is you should understand the data. Now I think if you're in a government agency, you should try and understand the data as well. So I, I think there's an advantage in, in, in knowing something about the models. I mean, I don't know if anybody works in establishment surveys here, but surveys of companies. But you know, the, the, what's the model in the surveys, uh, in, in establishment surveys? People use ratio estimates. Everything's ratio estimates. So it might actually be worth checking whether the ratio model is a good model for, for this thing you're trying to estimate. I mean, just to th throw down a ratio estimate and assume that's going to work. No, it's, let's look at the relationship between the, the, the variable and the, and, the, and the thing I'm, the size variable. Does it really follow a ratio model or not? Maybe not, maybe you should change that model. So, so understanding the, the, the data, I think, is not a bad thing. And I know that there's this feeling that you should be objective and there should be. I don't think being objective means not understanding the data. I think uh, you need to understand what, what, what the, we need to understand what we're modeling. Now, it could be more work computationally, and uh, that, the, people see that as a challenge in government agencies. Um, but, uh, to be honest, the survey, sample survey world is, is way behind the times in terms of computation. I mean, we can do anything computation now, really, so uh, this is much less of a barrier than, than uh, I mean, this, in terms of computational capabilities. Computational organization can be a trial. Um, when I was at the Census Bureau, I, I got, I, my feeling was the, the IT director, the computing part people, we're basically in business to make sure that nobody actually did any real work because doing actually real work actually involves some danger of disclosure or something. So you're not allowed to do anything. Um, I was at this, I'm sorry to, to digress, but I, this meeting in Manchester, one of the ladies from the Census Bureau was completely upset because she was going to talk about some simulation study that she'd done. and. Um, Apparently she was in, in Manchester and they, they were, she was running this simulation and the IT director stopped the simulations. She got an email message saying, we thought we didn't, there was more than one of these things going at the same time. So we thought that, that this was, might have been some, uh, not a real thing. And so we decided to delete your program. <laughs> so, she, so she was completely, up, distraught at not being able to present her results because I, I'm sorry if you're an IT person, but that, that that's IT at the Census Bureau. It's not, I'm sure it's not IT here. But. You know, so there are organisational issues in computation, I think, and certainly disclosure disclosure issues are very important. I mean, we have to worry about disclosure limitation, but uh, um, but computationally, we have incredibly powerful computers that can do anything these days, so I don't think it's really an issue. Okay, so uh, it's 11, so let's have, some, have a break. Then I'm going to talk about calibrated bays, which is 
my attempt to to have my cake and eat it. So, how many more slides do we have here? Let's see, where are we? 